Assalamu alaikum and welcome to today's episode of Karbala Reflections. We are here today to discuss prayer, the importance of prayer, and the benefits that Salah offers us in our daily lives. I'm joined today by Dr. Amina and Dr. Kate to shed some light on this life-changing topic. Thank you for being here today. Assalamu alaikum. Why do we pray? It starts off as basic as that. Well, that's a rather large question. I mean, this doesn't necessarily need to be limited to Islam, virtually every faith tradition. Right. In fact, one can say it's something that really defines a faith tradition, uh, involves some way of linking the human being to what is beyond um, whatever is considered the divine in that religion, which we call Allah Ta'ala, you know, the one monotheistic absolute being in, in existence, so to speak. Um, of course, Allah is beyond existence. But I think you can say first and foremost, it does elevate us out of the solely material world. Uh, if we don't have any form of prayer, whether it's formal or, or informal, whether it's a ritual prayer like the Salat or just a, a way of speaking with Allah or communicating with the Divine, uh, then it can be very difficult to lift ourselves out of the earthly existence and we miss out on a lot of the other aspects of the, the nature of the universe that we inhabit as well as our goal in life, as we believe, to come closer to Allah Ta'ala. I think um, exactly you, you touched on the thing that I believe the most is prayer is for us. No mm -hmm. one else is going to benefit from our worship or our prayers mm -hmm. other than ourselves. Yeah, and I think kind of if normal day-to-day -day life, we kind of, oh God, I've got to pray, you know, whatever. But actually when we realize the benefits, it is for us. It's not for Allah, it's for, it's for our benefits. Um, you know, it's like it's like when you plug your phone in to recharge, and it for Salah is like that. If you know, look at the five daily prayers, it's about you know it recharges us. It can kind of realign us with what's important in life. Um, I think the challenge is is to make sure that we connect kind of with Allah and with what we're saying in our in our Salah, rather than just kind of doing it kind of routinely and ritually. But when we do do that, it's yeah, it's transformative. It, it really is, and. Um, I also find personally it's the times when I need it most that are the times that kind of I'm perhaps leave it to later and things like that and that's kind of the thing that I personally struggle with as well but I you know I have found praying on time wherever I can making it a priority just noticing the the qualitative difference if you like and the impact on my kind of personal and spiritual life is is really immense and I suppose I was thinking I don't know I don't know if, if you've experienced this, but you make or do, you go to pray and you suddenly notice there's a whole load of dust on top of the bookshelf that, you know, all the washing up needs to be done. So yeah. A list of yeah, chores just pops into it mind. It just has, you know, all these distractions that Shaitan puts in along the way. Um, and I suppose I was, because of Maharam, I was reflecting on, and actually something that's kind of impacted me is even reading about kind of the lives of kind of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and what happened in Karbala. That during war they would always pray you know and stop on like when your life is under threat it, it doesn't matter they would always stop to pray and not just pray pray on time yeah pray Islam on time has yeah. put a great emphasis on praying on time mm. and right at the beginning right after the adhan uh, of course but we do have hadith uh speaking of the, the blessings of praying at the beginning of the time and and for many people exactly like you said it's a bit difficult mm. what would you say to someone who's finding it difficult to improve themselves in terms of the way they pray you know I think just kind of I just wanted to kind of slightly expand a bit on what I was saying you know thinking of Karbala and when they were praying when you know Imam Hussain and family were under attack they didn't just do that to be obedient they did it to be obedient but it would have given them something when their lives were at, at you know at the state actually the salah the prayer in that moment on time would have given them the courage and the strength and the perception to know that actually what they're about to do give their lives where it doesn't matter because it, it is all for Allah it would have given that spiritual strength so and I think that's bringing it back to our daily lives it's knowing the moment we're starting to oh, I'll do it in half an hour or I'll do it after this cup of coffee that's when we we need to really like rein ourselves in and I would say just just experiment literally I, I mean I was really bad and I'd always pray on time, but never at the beginning of time. And then, you know, I was really reflecting on the, the saying that the best good deed that you can do is to pray on time at the beginning of time. And actually, I, so I started doing it and I just 
then started loving Solar and wanting to do it on time. And it, it you just, if you, again, if you take that one step closer to Allah, he will then take 10 steps closer to you. And you just, you will feel the difference. Um, it doesn't become a chore anymore. It becomes something that you look forward to. Um, so I would just say people that are struggling, just try it as an experiment for a week. Try praying on time and notice. Observe if you notice any difference. Um, for some, uh, yeah, they, they, they struggle with praying and praying on time. Whereas for others, they, they've kind of taken prayers into their own hands, wouldn't you say? Um, I've met many people personally who are, you know, Muslims. They don't go by the prayers that have been taught to us necessarily the five times a day but they come and they say well you know what instead i'm going to meditate or i'm going to thank god in my own way what's islam's view on that well the quran advises us to pray at certain times of the day of course i'm sure they have their own counter argument there uh, in any case uh, one of the metaphors we do have for example from imam Sadiq, peace be upon him is that if someone and i'm sure we've all heard this before but never heard to repeat uh, if someone had a river running by their house and they bathed in the river five times a day would they have any dirt on them uh, mm -hmm. obviously not so the idea being that salat uh, purifies our soul and it's this is uh, one of the things that's mentioned salat purifies the soul and also as the holy quran says it keeps us from doing things that are wrong. Mm. So it's not like you need to be perfect to go and do your salat. Um, you might have done something that, that was really wrong and you know it's wrong and you're embarrassed before Allah, but that embarrassment before Allah is a good sign uh, because it shows the conscience is, in, conscience is intact and the heart is intact. Uh, and Allah loves us to return to him. So by returning to Allah at, at the time of salat, whether it's at the time or one hour after, two hour after, because as most of our viewers are aware within Islamic law, uh, there is a, a range of time in which it's considered acceptable to say the, the ritual prayers or, or the salat. Uh, in that way, we are encouraged to continually go back to Allah. And furthermore, when you know you're going to be facing Allah, you're less likely to do something that you're going to be embarrassed Allah in front of Allah. Mm. I mean, it's not that different when we see people. If I'm going to go see someone who I respect a lot, like a relative or a teacher or, or even a friend, uh, I'm not likely to do something that's really humiliating beforehand just because I'm going to be embarrassed to mm. see them next. I, I would, well, inshallah, I won't, but I would wait to do it at some other time. Mm. So when we are standing before Allah all the time, it does help us to have that, that focus and, and that uh, inner purity. Um, what would be some metaphors you would use for the Salat? I don't know. I, I just think it's like checking in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just constantly checking in. And I'm still processing kind of what, what you said, that some Muslims think, it, think it's okay or acceptable just to pray in their own way. Yeah. So obviously we have the, the recommended, we can make du'a and do extra prayers, but our obligatory is there. And I, I just think we have to be really careful because, again, it's like I think we've discussed in perhaps other shows that Islam is being changed and corrupted, yeah. and we're following our nafs here. Islam has pres prescribed the outer and the inner for specific reasons. And again, Imam Hussein like, died to save Islam and the true Islam. And actually, if we're going to corrupt it and take it off in our own way and our own agenda, um, that's extremely dangerous. And that's kind of just... Well, with yeah. respect to Imam Hussein, I do think that the emphasis that prayer had on the day of Ashura is a reminder of what he was standing for, that it wasn't mm. just a battle over succession or caliphate or leadership or this sort of thing, which sometimes some people, I'm not saying necessarily Muslims, but some people try to mm. advocate that viewpoint. Um, one of our popular speakers said once, I remember, he said that Karbala began and ended with Salat. No, I don't think it's 100% true. I mean, we do tell the account of Karbala, even mm. in the early books, beginning with Salat al-Fajr, and then after that, the battle began. Uh, it's certain that the midday Salat was a, a turning point because they knew mm. that would be their last prayer. There were companions who fell during that time. Uh, and then after that, uh, the rest of the uh, shahada gave their lives. But nonetheless, I, I think it's reasonable enough, especially because Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, was doing a du'a even in his last moment. Mm. Uh, but the fact that this was a central focus and something offhand, I would say all reporters uh, of the uh, Battle of Karbala will mm. mention, uh, indicates that it was uh, a pivotal aspect of what he was standing for, his mission, if you will. Mm.
and then other issues such as succession were secondary. And I think science is also starting to kind of unravel kind of the reasons behind a lot of Islamic practices, you know, and would do, they're now saying, which being something that the less kind of savoury topic of herpes, um, but you know, and the fact that we, we kind of wash ourselves daily, because that's a, a skin, it's a contact by skin kind of transmitted disease, but actually as Muslims, the fact we wash ourselves five times a day actually has so many benefits from kind of a, a disease perspective as well. And I'm sure the timings of the Salah prayers as well have got very specific reasons that are yes. for our benefit. And I know a lot of people like to get up um, sort of five o'clock in the morning. A lot of Buddhists like to get up mm. and meditate at that point. And it's a very special quality, the kind of the early morning. What you said about Salah being like checking in mm. and you went a step further and said, if you felt you were going to go visit a very important or respectable person, you would refrain from perhaps doing some stuff. It goes um, vice versa as well, doesn't it? Because for me, if I have just come from visiting a person who has influenced me, I would refrain for longer from doing a sin. So it's before it and afterwards. And I think perhaps, well, personal opinion, this might be the reason why there are gaps in prayers. Because again, many would come say, we'll do it at the end of the day, or we'll leave mm -hmm. it all for the very last minute. But exactly how you said, if we just give it a go, the benefits come to us without us having to go research them and seeing what it is that happens to us. I think in general that's the case with mm. Islamic practices. There, there is of course a virtue to reading what ulama have said about why we pray, why we do the takbir, why we do the ruku, and, and the inner meaning so to speak, but they also act on their own to shape a person. So for instance if you're fasting you don't really need someone to tell you why you're fasting. Now, I know some people like to talk about it, but the idea is this is something you will experience firsthand and you will be shaped by firsthand regardless of whether or not someone tells you why you are doing it. Sajda, for example. Mm. Uh, it's innate in the human being that this is a form of humbling and humility. Someone who's very arrogant is not going to do sajda ever to anyone or anything. Uh, so I do agree that these things act on us uh, simply as a sort of mechanism. Uh, what you said also reminded me of something that's narrated from the Holy Prophet وسلم, about one of the younger companions who had uh, who had some issues with, with some sins uh, and some people were discussing this as people have the habit of doing and he said don't worry about him because he prays all of his prayers five times a day so he's going to repent eventually. If he hasn't done it now uh, he will reach the stage that he will. The idea being that uh, if someone does maintain salat, even if they're involved in something that maybe they can't separate themselves from or they're not ready to, or they just they can't mm. quite make that leap yet, they, they eventually will, inshallah, mm. with, with the help of Allah. Inshallah. And for some people, that transition that you're, you're talking about happens overnight. You, we hear many stories about a person changing mm. in a split second, whereas others have tried to reach a certain point their entire lives and they may or may not reach that. Mm. Have you had such an experience? Have you had um, yeah. <laughs> a, a very moving salah or a very moving No, I think I situation. struggled a lot with Fajr prayer. Um, and I think particularly converting to Islam, and I was told you should never get up before seven. So it's been a jihad in itself just trying to establish the Fajr prayer on time. And you know, I'd set my alarm, but then it would go off and I, I wouldn't hear it, I'd go back to sleep. And I think eventually I got to the point where I just, for me, it was a realization I can't do anything by myself. It's only through Allah. So I, I mean, I was asking Allah, please make me wake up for Fajr and nothing really happened. But then I made one dua that, please Allah, I, I can't do it. I can only wake up for Fajr by your mercy and your grace. And subhanAllah, it, it, he answered that dua. So actually sure. doing that, the making, realizing I can't, wake up by myself I can't do anything by myself it's only Allah's mercy and grace that I was able to then then wake up and it just it kind of transforms something in me it um, goes ex back exactly to what you said you take one step towards Allah mm -hmm. you ask him for his help and he gives it yeah and just knowing that we can do we're nothing we are literally nothing without Allah we can't do anything by ourselves and I think that realization that, that we are completely dependent on Allah and I think just reading a lot of the du'as by the Ahlul Bayt or Imam Sajjad al-Islam, you know, they, they're pleading with Allah, they're asking for forgiveness. They are the most perfect human beings, yet they are the ones that are sort of asking for forgiveness of sins, highlighting how kind of we are nothing. And of the most perfect of people are calling out, what about the likes of us, you know, who, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's why we really have to scan ourselves for arrogance and ego and actually we are nothing, we are yeah. nothing. 
Have you had an experience you'd like to share? Um, I've heard it said, and I'm not quite sure what the textual or scriptural basis of this is. There may, in fact, be one that I'm not thinking of offhand. That we do have a revolution at one time in our lives, like a revolution to take you towards Allah. Towards me, I would say the most transformative experience I've had in my life was when I had the opportunity to visit Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, when I was 20. Uh, and that left a really lasting impact on my life and my direction in life, alhamdulillah. And that, that was a blessing from Allah. And that goes back to what you were saying, that there is a sort of mutual relationship between the human being and the creator with respect to even something like carrying out religious deeds. Uh, we do live in an era where I think we focus almost entirely on the free will of the human being. I will make my own destiny. Uh, I will choose what I'm going to do, which is true to, to some degree. We have responsibility. Um, we have jihad of the nafs and combat with the self. Uh, you do have a responsibility if you oversleep for Salat al-Fajr, for example. But there is also a, a tawfiq and, and a divine blessing to be able to to worship, to be able mm. to reach out to Allah or to be able to repent. For example, it's said that even Yazid could have repented if he had genuinely wanted to, but he was not going to have the opportunity to ever do that because of what he'd done to himself. So while the doors to Allah are open, uh, there is some relationship between what we're doing in life that might facilitate coming closer to Allah or worshiping or developing that connection uh, versus things that we might do that might block it. Now, of course, I'm not saying that oversleeping for Salat al-Fajr or missing Zuhur or, and so on is a sign of sinning or something like that, uh, but just that there is a mutual relationship. And if we are trying and also being humble and acknowledging our humble status, then inshallah Allah will help. And if he doesn't help, then Allah will forgive. Yeah. Uh, but if there is no humility, there really is no Salat after all, because the main point of the Salat is that we are standing before a being that is infinitely greater than ourselves. This is, you know, For example, when we look at how the Holy Prophet and his family like peace be upon all of them used to pray uh, Imam Zain al Abidin, for example used to be shaking you know like a, a tree in the wind so to speak or, or like an earthquake uh, because of the enormity of what he was standing before or it said that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, his one of his wives says that he used to sit with us and talk with us and eat with us and etc but when it was time for prayer it was as if he didn't know mm -hmm. us because his attention was 100% there. Now, of course, these are models and ideals. Not everyone is necessarily like that. Um, but the point being, these are things we can look at to be inspired inside ourselves. Absolutely. So that was definitely very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. However, it's very easy to be sitting in a setting and hearing these stories and get so inspired and really decide in ourselves that I'm going to work harder. I'm going to take my prayers more seriously. I'm going to pray on time, starting right now. What happens though is in the morning we go to school, we go to work and the difficulties that come alongside praying in public in a foreign country really start having an effect on us. I think especially for women this can be a particular challenge because at least for myself I don't always like to pray for example, I mean the salat in the middle of a park by myself and so forth mm. due to, you know, I, I like it to be a little bit private. Yeah. And yeah. I think in the, in the non, because I work in obviously a non-Muslim environment, and there was a time I'd I'd always pray within the prescribed times so where where possible. I'd wait till I got home, but actually I've kind of changed that. And I think yeah, for me it's I like to be private, but actually um, not to the extent that I would want mm. to miss my prayers. I, I meant with respect to the yeah. bowing and so forth. Yeah, you know? yeah, like no, not no, in the middle so, yeah. of the field where yeah. everyone's staring, but a little bit more. Yeah, in the no, of, of yeah. course, there's modesty there as yeah. well. Um, but I think it's for me personally. It was like, oh god, I don't want people watching me mm. or thinking, what's she doing? But actually, you know, if I can find at work at a quiet corner, a quiet space, people may walk past and may see me. But um, I've just kind of tried to overcome my kind of my fear of, of doing that and again linking it back to Imam Hussein Salam, you know they prayed on the battlefield when they were probably having arrows shot at them and it, it takes courage and I think yeah. particularly like you said particularly for women and, and I you know people say even if you're an aeroplane if it's time for prayer you pray <laughs> you get up in the aisle and pray um, I suppose yeah as a woman I'd want to try and find go right to the back or, or something but I would feel very self-conscious of that and obviously yeah, you don't want to bend down <laughs> in public if there's a man sitting next to you but yeah. it's it's, it's, it's a hard one, I think, particularly mm. for women, because we have to protect our modesty, especially. 
um, that yeah, we do need to pray. And actually, I find, you know, with non-Muslims, even if they've asked, they've actually felt apologetic if they've kind of walked in and I'm praying and stuff. Or it's actually given a chance to open up discussion about what are you doing? Yeah, and I why, mean, ultimately, why is prayer important? isn't something associated only with Muslims. And mm. even if a non-Muslim would pass by and see us praying, they might not pray the same way we do, but they understand the concept. And I think that's where the apology comes from. I personally, yeah. many times as well, I felt a bit self-conscious going in a public place and praying mm. for the lack of time. But... Uh, alhamdulillah, I haven't been given any issues. It yeah. seems that people are very open-minded. It's, it might be a bit more of us being in our own heads, of it yeah. making it it's a bit more fear. difficult for ourselves yeah, than it has it, to it's be. It's the fear of the same. It's the fear of what will people say if I wear hijab, what will people say if I kind of pray in a public yeah. area. And actually, when you do it, subhanAllah, my experience is actually I felt that real sense of kind of tranquility. And actually, you feel stronger. You feel actually empowered because you know you've, you're serving Allah, not society. You know, exactly. you're doing what Allah asks of you, regardless of if people want to sneer, that's their business, but actually you, feel, you get strength. I think Allah puts that strength into your heart. Exactly. You've chosen him over yeah. there. Yeah, and well, that, that's in regards to, like what you just said, doing what Allah has asked of you. There are some prayers that Allah hasn't asked from us. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we only have the five compulsory mm-hmm. prayers, but I mean, the amount of prayers that we can offer other than these five, it's a very large number. Of course, and we can't mm. forget, as you mentioned, some of the very beautiful du'as we have, um, du'as for all sorts of oh. circumstances and feelings yeah. and situations. Of course, not to uh, discount the value of speaking individually towards Allah, but there are uh, many different ways that are recommended in our tradition that we can approach Allah. Yeah, well, definitely, and I think, you know, I, I find different levels of connection as well, so sometimes it's the, the extra prayers, if it's a two rakah prayer here, or... Actually, in Qunut as well, I find mm. often in the, the Wajib prayers, it's the Qunut. That's where I find the connection. If I connect with what I'm saying, that's where I feel that closeness to a lot. Yeah. I think it's whatever works, and it's going to be different for different people, at different, all of us at different points. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Like, as people, we do evolve throughout our lives. We go through different situations. Mm. There may be different things that but touch our a, hearts at different times. It's a blessing, and I think the extra, the du'as and the supplementary yeah. prayers is, is such a blessing for us. Yeah, yeah, I think we've been blessed with such a wide variety of different ways to worship Allah, mm. other than the compulsory five prayers, which have their own status, that it really is trying to find what works for you. Mm-hmm. For some people, it might be the extra prayer. Salat al-Layl, I know, has had mm-hmm. a really big effect on many people. It might be a specific dua. I mean, for me, it's it's always been dua kumail. Mm-hmm. That, um, that, that's, that's very special mm-hmm. to me. And it's ultimately our duty to go and find what it is that we can do to get closer to Allah. It's In some ways, it seems that we are sitting and we expect a clear black and white answer to make everything right and make it make sense to us. And we kind of take away from our own responsibility of what we have to do to be able to get closer to Allah. Mm. Well, Allah is close to us. Yeah. Even the Holy Quran emphasizes in several ayat that Allah is always near, uh, but it's the human being that blocks yeah. Allah or distances Close to our jugular Allah. Vein, yes, otherwise Allah is the closest uh, thing to us, mm. as they yeah. say, stands between the human being and their heart. No, of course, but we can't take that for granted, just that Allah is close to us. I mean, personally, I still feel like I want to get closer. Mm-hmm. Even if he's closest yeah. to me, I uh-huh. want to get yeah, closer. Oh, yes, yeah. of course, yeah. it's just a reminder, because I think sometimes we do conceptualize the human being as being very far from Allah. Obviously, there is a, a concept of nearness mm-hmm. to Allah in our tradition as well. Um, but again, it's, it's due to what's going on inside of ourselves that's making us seem further away or distant. Mm-hmm. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate and Dr. Amina, for joining me today. I, I learned a lot, especially the part about how the prophets and how the imams used to pray. I must say that um, it gave me goosebumps. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your own personal experiences. And thank you for joining us on another episode of Karbala's Reflections. Today's episode has been moving to say the least the importance of prayer the benefits of prayer and the effects of prayer on individuals and societies thank you so much and we hope to see you soon assalamu alaikum